We come into a time of confession and assurance, a time where we confess our sins before God. And our call to confession is on the screen this morning. Merciful God, you call us to live in your mercy. You call us to believe in your redemptive power. You call us to live in your truths. We lift up our prayers to you. You are powerful and king of this world, and all things are in your fatherly hand. For all these things and more, we call upon your forgiveness. Let's go to a time of silent prayer where we lift up our sins before God and ask for his forgiveness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Amen. We are reminded that though we have sinned in Christ, there is forgiveness and life. For as it says in Colossians, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code with all its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed all the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. In light of that, let us read our assurance of pardon. We are called to believe in Christ alone. Praise be to God, in Christ we are We are called to be a people who speak the truth of the gospel. We are called to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Amen. In response to that, let's stand and sing in our lives, Lord, be glorified. The scripture today is Judges 4, 
You can find that on page 256 in your Bibles. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hogoyim. Because he had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. Because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zenanim, near Kedesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him from Herosh of Hogoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has give, given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth Hagoim. All troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. But Jabal, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and, and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us your word. Send now your spirit into this place. Illumine our hearts and our minds. Help us to understand what you are speaking to us this morning. Help us to write it upon our hearts and help us to live it out faithfully each day. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Our passage this morning is not about how girls are better than boys. Although God uses gender differences to highlight his own power. In our passage, a female, who usually has no place in the politics, serves as a leader of Israel. And a housewife is the one who defeats a general. And that's because those who are usually thought of as weak in our passage are strong in faith and are used to show God's strength. The strong male generals and kings, the ones who lead with force and with strength, they are shown to be weak in their faith. You can think of our passage this morning this way. There's two voices speaking. There's the voice of strong faith. And this morning I'm going to be the strong voice of faith. This is the voice willing to follow God's commands. This is the voice that follows God no matter what God calls them to do. And there's the voice of weak faith or doubt. And that's me this morning, my voice. This is the voice that's hesitant and uncertain. This is the voice that says, did God really call me to do that? This is the voice that asks, does God really expect me to pick up my cross and follow him? These two voices are present in our passage this morning, and these two voices are present in our lives. Today, Pastor Mark and I are going to tell the story of Judges 4 using these two voices, and then we will share our story using these two voices. Judges 4 begins with a theme very common in the Old Testament. The people of Israel, once again, have stopped being faithful to God. This happens again and again throughout the entire Old Testament. Israel is supposed to be faithful to God and God alone. They made a promise that they and their children would serve God. Of course, this was at Mount Sinai, years and years before our passage takes place. So these are the great, 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 how many other great-grandchildren of the people who made that original promise. But they were still bound by that promise to serve God alone. But often a generation would come and stop serving God, as this generation did. So God turns them over to their enemy. He does this to remind them that without God, they have nothing. This time God lets Jabin conquer part, if not all, of the people of Israel, and he oppresses them for 20 years until Israel cries out to God to be saved. So God brings up a new judge. You see, Israel didn't have kings or presidents to lead them. Well, most of you know that they did have kings, but they came a little bit later. Before they came along, though, the Israelites had judges. Now, judges in Israel's time were very similar to judges in our day. They ruled over cases. They decided who is right and who is wrong. But they were also a little bit different as they were the wartime leaders and the political leaders. But in our story this morning, we have Deborah. She is a leader of Israel. And she is also a prophet. So this means that God spoke to her in very clear ways. And she would take God's word and she would share it with God's people. This way, the people of God would know his will. Now, the Lord told Deborah to instruct Barak to take his very strong army and fight Jabin. God promised that Barak would win the battle. So Deborah sent for him and told him exactly what God would do. So Barak came. And heard what Deborah said, that God would help him defeat Jabin. But Barak had his doubts. He may have had an army of 10,000 and the assurance that God would give him the victory, but he insisted that Deborah come with him because he didn't really believe what God said was possible. So Deborah told Barak that she would be beside him. But she also said that because of his unbelief, true victory would not be his. Deborah knew that God's word was true. 
She believed that God would help them defeat their enemies. And Deborah would be with Barak during the battle to show him that all things are possible with God. So Barak went up to fight Jabin's general, Sisera, and Barak won the battle. But that wasn't the real victory, because Sisera escaped. But Sisera didn't get very far. He went to the tent of Jael, who he thought was a friend. But Jael recognized the king's wickedness, so she invited him into her tent. But while he was asleep, she pounded a tent peg through his skull. Jael brought true victory to the people of Israel, just like God had promised. Fast forward 3,000 years. And what does this bloody story have anything to do with us? We aren't a conquered people. We don't have to fight an army, and we certainly aren't supposed to put tent stakes through people's heads. So why do we read Judges 4 this morning? What does this story have anything to do with us? A different time and a different place, but the story of Barak and Deborah is very similar to our story. For us, it's a question of how we will respond to God's word and whether or not we will believe that God can do dramatic and wonderful things in our lives today. You see, that's what Barak wasn't getting. He believed in God. He knew what God could do, perhaps. He believed and believed that God was calling him to fight Jabin's army. That wasn't what Barak got wrong. But he couldn't quite believe that God promised victory. He doubted. He didn't believe that God could really do that. He didn't have faith that God would come through. Fast forward 3,000 years to us sitting in these pews. The Bible proclaims wonderful and powerful things that are possible through God. And we believe that what the Bible says is true. But in our hearts, we can doubt that certain things are possible. The Bible tells us, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Anyone who believes, no matter who they are, can be saved and transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. The book of Galatians tells us that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. None of that matters. Christ can claim anyone. And this is the wonderful truth of the gospel. And yet in our hearts, we have prisoners and gays, drug abusers and anarchists. We have people who we do not believe will ever believe. That certain people can straighten out the mess of their lives seems impossible. That Christ would work in them, through them, or save them, we doubt. We know that God can save anyone. We say that all the time. But when we look at a certain person, we doubt the power of Christ to save. Maybe not that person. And certainly not this person will see the kingdom of heaven. The book of Acts says, the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was being built up walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Here we read that God causes his kingdom to grow. Not only can we grow deeper in faith, but God can add more and more people to the church every single day. We know those words are true, but they seem to be more true for others and not always for us. Churches close all the time. And maybe we look around and don't think the wonderful things that God did in the book of Acts, that he could do that here. Yes, our faith can deepen, but that God could add to this church daily. Maybe not. 
Scripture declares firmly that Jesus Christ will come again. There will be a shout and a loud trumpet blast, and our Lord Jesus Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. He will come in victory. Sin will be no more. We will live in a world that is perfect and full of God's presence. Yet when we talk about Christ coming again, we don't think it will ever happen. It's a thought or an idea, but not a reality. After all, it's 2,000 years since Christ walked this world. Will he come again in our lifetime? Maybe, but we don't look forward to it. It's not something we crave. We certainly believe it's true, but we also may think it will never happen. If we're honest, we often doubt what God can do. We read in Scripture what is possible through Christ, and we walk through this world as though it cannot happen. God can't fix a marriage. God can't heal the sick overnight. God cannot work in the hearts of the depressed. God can really not take those lost in their sins and speak salvation. God can't help people give up their anger or addictions, bad habits, or repair relationships. The Bible says it's possible, but we don't. Take a moment and think through your life. What do you think will never happen or solve itself? Have we failed to believe that with God all things are possible? If so, we can live with our doubts. We can walk the Christian walk never really believing that Christ can do amazing things. And then, like Barak, we miss out on the real power and the real victory that God gives. Or we can have faith to see the amazing things that God does. We can see how God repairs marriages. We can see how the sick find healing, sometimes miraculously so. People change for the better. Churches grow. And the worst of sinners find new life in the mercy of Jesus Christ. All these things can happen and so much more because God is actively working in our lives. God is powerful. And his actions are powerful too. So if we have faith, we can see what God is doing. If we have faith, we share in and celebrate the wonderful victories of God. If we have faith, we can pray boldly for God to do wonderful things in our lives and in the lives of others. Now, this doesn't mean that God will do everything we ask him to do. But it means that our prayers are full of the assurance that God can do anything. There are two voices that can speak in our lives every day. This is the voice that says, maybe God has done something like that in the past, perhaps. But certainly he won't do it in the future. This is the voice that doesn't want to believe or, or can believe anything is possible with God. And this is the voice that misses out on the amazing things that God does every day. And this is the voice that firmly declares that all things are in God the Father's hands. In the midst of this broken and sinful world, God heals the brokenhearted. In the middle of chaos and strife, God brings order and purpose. In the middle of angry words, God helps us speak praise. In the middle of grief, God speaks hope. In the middle of sin, God speaks forgiveness. This is the voice that proclaims the victories of God. This is the voice that doesn't know how to praise God because it can't see what he's doing. And this voice firmly declares that God is light in the darkness. God has breathed life into the dead. 
He's with us always till the day that we see him face to face. This is the voice of praise on Sunday morning, full of joy because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. As Christians, we can often speak with this voice, and doubt sprinkles our prayers and our views on life. And yet, Pastor Ashley and I hope we never speak with this voice. But that we firmly believe all things are possible with God. We pray for the miraculous. We celebrate all that God does. For in God is a victory unlike any other. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we know that a voice of doubt is often very real in our lives. The voice of doubt speaks and we fail to believe that all things are possible with you. We fail to recognize the wonderful things you do each day. How sinners go to their knees and cry out for forgiveness. How our lives are transformed through the power of your Holy Spirit. How you lead us and guide us as a church in your wisdom, in your path. How you add to the numbers of churches daily all over this world. How you deepen our faith each day. Heavenly Father, wipe away any doubts we have, and let us cling firmly to the belief that all things are possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray boldly as people, full of the assurance that you can do whatever you want to do. And let us cling to the hope found in Jesus Christ, a hope beyond anything else. And let us speak that hope, the wonderful and true victory of Jesus Christ over the grave. Let us never speak with a voice of doubt, but a voice that rings forth the victory of Jesus Christ, full the assurance that all things are in your fatherly hands. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat>